Hi everyone, um, my name's Laura Morrissey and this is some of the work that's been going on in the Gola Craton over the last 10 or so years trying to understand the mesoproterozoic metamorphism that we see. So the other talks in this session have uh, talked us, told us quite a lot about the magmatic style that we see during the Hiltaba and the GRV event and we have quite a good idea about what's going on in the upper crust. We have these um, voluminous volcanic deposits, we have the mineral deposits in the eastern and central Gola Craton, but we don't know quite so much about what's going on underneath all of that in the mid to lower crust. So there are a few things about the magmatism that can give us some clues. The first thing is that the Hiltaba and the GRV magmatism was extremely hot, very high temperatures, and we have things like inverted pigeonite in some of the magmatic rocks, um, supporting the idea that these rocks these, this magnetism was really hot. Um, we also know from the isotopes and from lots of the work that Claire has been doing that the Hiltaba and the GRV incorporated a lot of crust. So that suggests we had a lot of crustal melting um, and the mid to lower crust was also very hot. And finally, we know that there's also a significant role for the mantle. So we're in a system that involves bottom up heating and um, a significant mantle input. If we have these high temperatures and the high temperature magmatism in the upper crust, what we would expect to see in the mid to lower crust is really high grade granulite facies metamorphism and melting. So we would expect to see something like these rocks on the right, um, rocks that have experienced partial melting and now have anhydrous granulite facies mineral assemblages. The ages of this metamorphism um, is going to be synchronous with the age of magmatism. But we also then have to think about how metamorphism and um, metamorphic events are recorded in the crust. So in the upper crust, things cool very quickly. And that means that we can get these discrete ages. We can unravel different pulses of magmatism and different pulses of fluid flow. And um, it's easier to get a complete and coherent story. In the lower crust, what we see depends a lot on how the lower crust behaves immediately after the magmatic and metamorphic event. So if the lower crust is exhumed immediately following this event, um, what we'd expect to see is relatively fast cooling, so um, reasonably clear geochronology, and probably a mineralogical expression of this event as well, so decompression dominated PT paths. If the lower crust stagnates and remains at depth, then what we're probably going to see is really complicated geochronology that looks apparently quite long lived, um, slow cooling, and probably mineralogically cooling dominated PT paths. Which then brings us to the Gola Craton, which is complicated to start with because it has multiple um, overprinting metamorphic events. So it becomes very difficult to really understand what the time scale of a tectonic event is. Uh, the Gola has previously been home to extremely long lived metamorphic events, um, which are the result probably of overprinting. And as people have done more geochronology, they've started to unravel these events. But there is still an idea that things in the Gola Craton last for a long time. Um, we've been a bit slack in the Gola because we use terms like circa 1600 MA, and that is used to cover almost anything from 1620 down to 1550 or even younger. But in this time interval, that actually encompasses St. Peter's Sweet Magmatism. It encompasses the hilt of a magmatic event, uh, Century Stricto. And then it also encompasses this tailing off um, in the geochronology that is referred to as the Carrara and Orogeny. And the significance of that is not that well understood yet. I um, and others are guilty of using terms like broadly contemporaneous, but the problem with this term is that it actually makes it difficult then to pull apart the causes and the consequences and the links between magnetism and metamorphism. So, where the Hiltaba and the GRV event sits, the magmatic rocks um, are shown here in reds and pinks, and they sit in the core of the craton. And on the right, I've plotted up all the magmatic ages in the South Australian Geochronology database, um, plus some of my own, which are within uncertainty of the main peak in magmatism. So most of the magmatism occurs between 1595 and 1585. Um, so we can see that there is um, a lot of regions around the edge of this which record um, 
metamorphic ages within uncertainty of, of the magnetism. But we can also then see that there's also a range in geochronology that goes down to about 1530 in all of these regions. So let's just visit some of the regions that are typically thought to have recorded the um, hills of the, to have been in the mid lower crust during the Hiltabur event. So that's um, places like Cooper Pedy Ridge and Maple Creek Ridge and Mount Woods in the northern Gola Craton, the Barossa Complex in the southern Gola Craton, and also potentially the York Peninsula. So Cooper Pedy Ridge and Maple Creek Ridge was looked at by Catherine Cutts about 10 years ago. And she got quite a, uh, quite a simple story in terms of her geochronology. So uh, she got metamorphic monazite ages that sat somewhere between 1595 and 1585, which corresponds really well to the timing of the Hiltzberg magnetism in these regions. Um, her PT paths varied a little bit between Maple Creek Ridge and Cooper Pedy Ridge, with Cooper Pedy Ridge having more of a heating dominated um, PT evolution. But the difficulty with these PT paths and um, her story was that other people have dated samples from either the same drill holes or uh, nearby drill holes, and they've got a range of ages um, down to about 1550. So that's just, um, although she got quite a simple story, there are definitely samples in this region that record geochronology that goes down to much younger ages. Mount Woods has been sort of the poster child for um, uh, mid to lower crustal region, mid crustal region during the Hiltzberg magmatic event. And that's probably partly because it sits just north of Prominent Hill. And it's also known to contain Hiltzberg granites. Um, there are two, metam two magmatic ages corresponding to the Hiltzberg event in um, the South Australian Geochronology database shown as those yellow dots. And then there are two metamorphic zircon ages that also correspond to the Hiltzberg event. So we can see there's actually not that much geochronology from the Mount Woods region. Um, I've come and I have gone and collected a whole lot from the centre of the Mount Woods domain and what I found is that the central domain, the metamorphic um, mineral assemblages and probably most of the structures are actually kimbin in age. Along the shear zones, there is um, definitely some younger overprinting, but most of the monazite in Mount Woods actually postdates that Hiltzberg interval and um, comes down to younger ages again, so younger than 1580 MA. So as I mentioned, the shear zones, um, particularly these big northeast southwest shear zones that bound Mount Woods, they give ages of about 1570 to 1560 MA. Uh, the Skylark shear zone gives an age of about 1550, and that overprints Kimban aged mineral assemblages. So the Mount Wood story is probably that there's a high grade uh, granulite facies Kimban event, and then the Southern Mount Woods records uh, Hiltzberg and younger aged metamorphism. The metamorphic architecture from Mount Woods is really all hung on one particular sample, which is has these very spectacular um, cordierite, spinel, garnet, um, symplectites. This um, has an EPMA age of 1615, which was interpreted to be the prograde age, and the peak metamorphism was interpreted to then be the age of the Hiltzberg granites in the region. Um, the metamorphism was constrained using overlapping the, the compositions of these symplectites overlain with um, a PT diagram from the bulk rock of this sample, and that gives um, four and a half kilobars and 750 degrees. So this is thought to have been the depth at Mount, which Mount Woods was buried during the um, Hiltzberg event. But it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. So when I redated it, what I found is that there's a significant Kimban age population um, overprinted by a mesoproterozoic spinel cordyrite garnet assemblage. The problem with this is it means that the PT paths that are inferred from Mount Woods and the metamorphism is based on a composite mineral assemblage. So um, potentially Mount Woods, the metamorphic story in Mount Woods is a lot more complicated than has been previously recognised. The Barossa complex um, 
is also a region that is probably not as well understood as it could be because it's also quite complicated. So it contains 1630 MA magnetism in the northern inliers. There's also what's thought to be Hiltaber aged pegmatites and magnetism throughout the inlier. Um, and there are definitely Hiltaber aged metamorphic zircon rims um, that show up in some of these samples. Monazite from the Maiponga inlayer gives an age of about 1580, um, whereas monazite from the Houghton inlayer gives ages of 1550. Mineralogically, the Maiponga and Houghton inlayers are extremely similar, and they both record this similar PT path. So what's not clear is whether this PT path is real and which event it relates to, or whether it's actually a function of superposition of a 1580 metamorphic event and a 1550 MA metamorphic event. So just to sum up those um, high-grade regions, I guess, if you would remove the magnetism and the mineralization, there's very few locations that contain a geochronological record that's synchronous with the Hiltaber magnetism that doesn't also then contain this younger overprint in either the same samples or um, similar, similar close by um, samples or regions. And that can tell us something about the tectonic setting. So what we need as um, we've talked about is that in the lower crust, if it's exhumed quickly, we should get quite clean geochronology um, and potentially these decompressional PT paths. But if the crust sits there um, and remains at depth, it stays hot and instead we get slow cooling and apparently long-lived metamorphism. And the geochronology from all these regions is probably consistent with um, that sort of setup. So what we have is temporal snapshots of the same system. So in the central Gola Craton, things cool quickly because they're in the upper crust. And so we have an apparently short time interval for magmatism and um, mineralization. So the magmatic rocks are actually recording the processes that are happening in the lower crust at the start of the event. Whereas these lower crustal or high temperature metamorphic rocks that we see around the edges, they cool slowly and they have this apparently long lived metamorphism because they remain at depth and they're not exhumed. And because they remain at depth and they remain hot and weak, they can be reworked and so there's a the potential that the structural character that we see in them today does not necessarily reflect the tectonic regime at the time that the granites were being emplaced in the upper crust. The tectonic setting um, of the Hiltaber event needs something that allows the lower crust to remain at depth um, and also the preservation of the upper crust. So this is probably not a major compressional event with lots of crustal thickening because that's likely to result in exhumation. Instead, something like Liz and Claire have been suggesting, which is that the Hiltzberg magnetism is probably, is probably plume related, um, rather than being the result of a large tectonic event. And in fact, the fact the spatial patterns that we see where the GRV and the Hiltzberg sit in the center of the Gola Craton on this older crust might suggest that they're actually, um, they sit in the strong cratonic part. So the crust underneath it was probably already strong and it took a plume to melt it and soften it for later reworking. In contrast, next door in the Kernamona, we have orogenesis, we have crustal thickening, we have S-type granites. So that suggests the crust is behaving differently in the Kernamona to what we see in the central Gola Craton where the GRV is outcropping at present. And the preservation of the upper crust rocks in the, um, in the Gola Crater suggests a significant difference in crustal rheology. And in fact, the generation of the Hilter event has probably caused even further long-term strengthening relative to this younger and weaker crust around the edges. So that brings me to York Peninsula, which is um, interesting because it, we know that there's evidence parts of York Peninsula were in the upper crust during the Hiltzber event. We have Hiltzber granites, we've got mineral systems, we've got high level alteration. But it also contains these upper amphibolite facies um, metamorphic rocks. So Mitchell Bachman has done some work on these and what he's found is that they have an age of 1555. 
They were metamorphosed to about three and a half kilobars and 600 degrees, so upper amphibolite fasces. So relatively high thermal gradients, but then they also come from quite steep fabrics. So what we might see, what that might suggest is that these are recording contractional deformation. However, we do have to note the fact that um, because they're extremely high thermal gradients, there is probably also some excess heat that's being put into the system. But the fact that we see this um, potential for contractional deformation and first cycle orogenesis in places like York Peninsula, contrasted with the fact that in places like Mount Woods, we have shear zones that were probably recording exhumation, um, suggests that we have slightly different, um, slightly different controls on this reworking event, but we see them around the edge of, this, of the central Golda crater. So these are probably the less competent regions, um, which allow them to partition later deformation. Um, and it's just important to understand what shear zones were doing when they were active um, and the major, stru major stress regime, because in crystalline rocks like this, it's shear zones that are gonna provide the real crustal permeability and the potential for fluid flow. So Mount Woods is a good example of where it's really important to understand the timing of all of these different shear zone um, generations. So Can Hill sits on an east-west trending shear zone and the monazite ages from that are coming out at around 1480 MA. However, we also know that the northeast southwestern shear zone, southwest trending shear zones that bound um, Mount Woods in the south give ages of around 1570. So there's a range of, um, and then there are probably some shear zones in the middle, which actually will give Kimbin ages. So there's a range of shear zone ages um, and understanding which ones were active when is really important for understanding um, patterns of reworking and also patterns of fluid flow. So just to end, um, thinking beyond the hilt of it, GRV, as a tectonic event, the hilt and the GRV was probably relatively non-tectonic. There was not huge amounts of crustal thickening. We don't have real that many, much evidence for um, large shear zones being active. And in fact, most of that stuff seems to happen after the Hilteberg magmatic event has already finished. There's significant variation in the levels of exhumation um, after the Hilteberg GRV event. So things like the Barossa complex look like they were quite deeply buried during the Hilteberg event. Whereas places like um, York Peninsula actually looked like they remained quite high in the crust during the Hiltborough event and then were reburied, um, or parts of them were reburied after the Hiltborough event had concluded. So it's actually the post 1590 MA events um, which really control the metamorphic architecture of these regions around the edges, and they include a whole range of things, including first cycle orogenesis in places like York Peninsula, exhumation. Um, probably in places like Mount Woods and the Barossa complex, and shear zone formation and reactivation. And all of these events have the potential for fluid generation and fluid flow, and even the addition of new metals into the crust. Thanks for listening.